Thank you, Anne. Wow, God is good. Would you stand for our scripture reading? It comes from Mark chapter 6, verses 30 through 44. The apostles returned to Jesus from their ministry tour and told him all they had done and taught. Then Jesus said, let's go off by ourselves to a quiet place and rest a while. He said this because there were so many people coming and going that Jesus and his apostles didn't even have time to eat. So they left by boat for a quiet place where they could be alone. But many people recognized them and saw them leaving, and people from many towns ran ahead along the shore and got there ahead of them. Jesus saw the huge crowd as he stepped from the boat, and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. Late in the afternoon, his disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place, and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to nearby farms and villages and, and buy something to eat. But Jesus said, You feed them. With what? they asked. We'd have to work for months to earn enough money to buy food for all these people. How much bread do you have? he asked. Go and find out. They came back and reported, We have five loaves of bread and two fish. Then Jesus told the disciples to have the people sit down in groups on the grass. So they sat down in groups of 50 and 100. Jesus took the five loaves and the two fish. He looked up toward heaven and blessed them. Then, breaking the loaves into pieces, he kept giving the bread to the disciples so they could distribute it to the people. He also divided the fish for everyone to share. They all ate as much as they wanted, and afterward the disciples picked up 12 baskets of leftover bread and fish. A total of 5,000 men and their families were fed. May God nudge us with new ideas as we consider his words and Jesus' actions. You can have a seat. Well, good morning, everybody. Before I get too further far into it, I want to mention, too, that uh, this is the last Sunday that Johanna and Mackenzie Conver will be with us. They've been here since September, but they leave on Saturday to return to their Bible translation project in Asia. They'll be available in the foyer following the service, so take advantage of that chance to uh, wish them well and remember to pray for them as they go. Welcome to the fifth Sunday of Lent, a.k.a. two weeks until, Christmas, until Easter. <laughs> Got my church holidays a little confused there for a second. Two weeks. Now, you know that Easter is a big day for us, right? See, lots of folks, we add a worship service at 8 o'clock, okay? And uh, so if some of you are early risers and want to come at 8 o'clock, that's great. It takes a little pressure off of the next two services, both the sanctuary and probably that's even a little bit more crucial in the parking lot. So keep that in mind. Also, um, because April 5th uh, is Easter Sunday, it would normally be a communion Sunday, but we've done this before. We're going to postpone communion until April 12th. We're really on a tight time schedule, so we will not try to serve communion on Easter Sunday. So keep that in mind. You'll have the opportunity for communion on uh, April 12th. Today we are continuing our A Call to Live series with a message about living creatively. Next week, Pastor Dave is going to finish off this series with a message about living fully. And that will be Pastor Dave's last service as a member of our staff, so he's going to preach that message, and it'll be kind of an opportunity for him to say farewell to us at KCC. And in case you're worried about it, we will have a retirement celebration for Pastor Dave as well. That'll be on April 26th. Uh, we can only manage about one retirement celebration per month, okay? Uh, but Dave and uh, Sue will be in the area through June, so they'll come and join us on that last Sunday of April 
in the afternoon, and we'll have a celebration of Dave's ministry here. Actually, he totals up to about 10 years, two different stints, five years each time, so that'll be uh, fun for us to do. Uh, the passage that we're looking at today is this familiar story of Jesus feeding at least 5,000 people. Uh, do you remember, you heard from the story, how many loaves did he have? Five. And how many fish did he have? Two. You got those from some kid, you know, who brought a sack lunch or something. Uh, and uh, so that's what he had to start with. And usually when you hear a message on this passage, it's about this amazing, unlimited, infinite power of God to accomplish anything that God wants to accomplish. And there's usually a message in it about our need to have faith, to trust in God. And I believe that is really the central meaning of this story, what we're supposed to take away from it. It's that thing that kind of jumps off the page and just bites you on the nose. Wow, look at this amazing power of God. Nothing is impossible to God. But as I was working with this passage and um, wanting to talk about creativity, I looked at it through the lens of creativity, and I realized there are a lot of connect points between faith and creativity. And we learn a lot from this passage about how to be creative in serving God. As a matter of fact, faith requires us to get creative. Now, what is the idea underneath that word create? What does it mean? It means to make something, doesn't it? And we read in the scripture that God created this whole world, and what did he start with when he created the world? Nothing. It says God created the world out of nothing. He just had this amazing ability as God, okay? Now, it also says that we as human beings are created in whose image? In God's image, okay? So when we create something, when we make something good, what are we doing? We're living out what it means to be created in the image of God, aren't we? And this morning, we want to focus on ways we can be creative, ways we can do things, ways we can make things in the service of God, so that by being creative, we are glorifying God. And uh, toward the end of my message, I'm going to get a little help with some folks who are using very creative gifts that God has given them to serve God. I want to call our attention to a couple of things in the story. The first one I want to uh, refer to as the creativity challenge. Jesus said to the disciples, you feed them. Remember the story and how it sets up, okay? Uh, this came at a time after the disciples had been sent out in twos to minister in Jesus' name, okay? And he sent them a lot of different directions, all the towns and villages throughout Israel, and um, they had come back with these amazing stories about the power of God. They had announced the good news that in Jesus, God was inviting people to come to Him to be forgiven, to experience His love, to enter into His kingdom, and uh, they were even performing miracles in Jesus' name. They were healing people who had been ill, and they came back probably tired but on fire about the amazing things that they'd seen God accomplish. Well, you know, Jesus did not start out on this day to teach. He ended up doing that. What happened? They were, they were on their way to kind of have a retreat, you know, to have some downtime, to share some stories around the campfire, to get off in the wilderness. But what happened? We well, you know the story. Jesus was gaining in popularity. He really couldn't go anywhere without attracting a crowd, right? And so it says that the crowd, when they saw Jesus and he and his disciples were headed off towards the wilderness, you know, they gathered around him and they ran alongside of him. And it says that Jesus looked at them and had compassion on them. Remember that word compassion from last week? That deep visceral feeling that requires us to make some kind of a response. He had compassion on them because they were what? Like sheep without a shepherd. What did that mean? Well, it meant that when Jesus looked at these crowds, he realized how spiritually hungry they were and how much in need of good teaching about God and God's love and God's grace they needed. 
and they weren't getting it from their religious leaders. And so out of this sense of compassion, Jesus said, all right, we're going to change plans, and I'm going to teach the people. And so they sat down in a crowd around him, and it says Jesus taught all morning, and Jesus taught all afternoon, and as they were closing in on the end of the day, the disciples started to jump up and wave their arms, Jesus, Jesus, we got to call this thing to a halt. we got to stop. These people haven't had anything to eat. you got to send them into the farms and villages and towns nearby so they can hit the fast food joints. They're hungry. And what did Jesus say? He said, "Uh uh-uh. No, we're not going to do it that way. I got a better idea. He said to his disciples, you feed them. You feed them. And that was the creativity challenge for them. And uh, you can tell how much they liked it. What was their response? What did they say? Just two words. With what? Get real, Jesus. You got 5,000 people or more here. We don't have any food. We don't have enough money. Come on, it would take several months' wages to feed a crowd like this. With what? But Jesus didn't let up. He persisted. Jesus put the burden of solving this dilemma squarely on his disciples. Now, what's that old saying? You've heard this before. Necessity is the mother of invention. Isn't there a saying kind of like that? Yeah. All right, that's where Jesus put his disciples. So here's what I want to know. Has God ever asked you to do anything that seemed impossible to you? I'll rephrase it just a little bit. Has God ever asked you or called you to do anything when you first heard about it, you thought, I can't do that, that's, that's unachievable. I, I don't think I could do that. That just sounds too big. Raise your hand if you had a moment like that. You had one of those moments, okay? Enough people raised their hands that I just can't go around the room and make everybody tell their story. Aren't you glad to hear that? You don't have to tell your story. But we've had those moments, you know, when it seems clear to us, God wants me to do something, and I just don't believe I can do it. I don't believe it can be done. Well, you know the old saying, you should never say never to God. What happens when you say to God, I could never do that? It's like you just laid down the gauntlet, right? It's like you just put out there the challenge for Him, right? Oh, yeah? Let me show you what I can do in your life. It's even a Bible verse that uh, emphasizes this. It's Ephesians 3.20. Sometimes we use it uh, as um, uh, a benediction, a blessing. Let's put that up on the screen. There it is. I think we ought to all say this together, and let's just let it kind of sink in as we say it, okay? Now all glory to God, who is able through His mighty power at work within us to accomplish more than we might ask or think. Folks, is that ever a powerful verse, a powerful promise? Now all glory to God who is able through His mighty power at work within us. That's a good reminder, isn't it? It's His power at work within us to accomplish more, more than we might ask or think. That's the God we serve. Jesus was issuing a creativity challenge. He was saying to them, get busy and find a solution. Be creative. That leads us to the next one. I'm calling it the creativity assessment. That's where you kind of start to figure things out. Jesus said to them, how much bread do you have? Check and see how much food we can come up with from the people that are in this crowd. In other words, don't tell me what you don't have. Tell me what you do have. Folks, faith starts with a positive focus. It's not the whole deal. There's more that goes on after that. But faith starts with this positive focus. Maybe there is a way. All right? Now, I'm not trying to go Tony Robbins on you. Don't worry. But I do want to ask you this question. How big is your God? How big is your God? I'm sure they came back and said something like, well, you know, we've only got five loaves and two fish, and come on, crowd's 5,000. This will never be enough. 
And Jesus is going, would you quit using the word never in the way that you think? Folks, creativity starts with what we do have, not what we don't have, okay? So, you know, from time to time, we just need to make an assessment of what we do have and quit talking about what we don't have. How many times have we talked ourselves out of trying something that God was prompting us to do because we said, I don't have enough. I don't have enough money. I don't have enough time. I don't have enough energy. I don't have enough talent. I don't have enough volunteers to help me. I don't have a big enough house. Whatever it is. We talk ourselves out of it before we give God a chance. Jesus said to them, don't tell me what you don't have. Tell me what you do have. In this uh, leadership cohort for covenant pastors that I've led, I led it last year, and I was a co-facilitator for it for a couple of years. We have this small group exercise. It's just one of my favorite exercises. I just think this is so much fun. I'll tell you how it works. We um, give each group, and there's usually about four in the group, uh, a paper bag with some just kind of ordinary things in it. And it's got some yarn. These are things that might show up in the bag, and they don't all get the exact same thing. Maybe some cardboard, maybe some scotch tape or masking tape, uh, some pipe cleaners, um, some styrofoam maybe, uh, cardboard, you know, the kind of stuff that you probably find in our Learning Resource Center, some kind of craft-oriented things. And we give each group a fresh egg, okay? And here's the challenge. They get like a half an hour to put together some kind of a protective container uh, to put that egg in because they're going to take the egg to a place that's about 10 feet or 12 feet high. We always in our retreat centers can find a place like that, and they're going to drop it on the concrete, okay? And it forces them to get creative, you know, in what they're going to build. And we tell them you can trade materials with other groups, but they never do that, all right? Uh, they just work with what they've got and, you know, try to use everything they can. And you just wouldn't believe some of the creative things I've seen. I've seen people build little parachutes, you know, to try and cushion the fall. Okay, so um, this last year, when I, when I facilitated the group last spring, uh, we had four groups, I think, and every single one of the groups, the egg survived. It didn't break. Now, the ones we had before that, some of them, you know, broke. But the emphasis is on get creative, helps if somebody has an engineering mind. And then it's also the group experience, you know, kind of got to work together on this and, and figure it all out. It's amazing to me. All of them managed to come up with a way to protect that egg so it didn't break. We had a guy uh, who was from a rural church um, in, um, I think he's in Nebraska, and he says, you don't have to buy eggs. I'll bring the eggs. So he brought the eggs, and we used them, and they all survived. And he said, now I'm taking the eggs home with me. I'm going to eat them. So everything worked out great there. Do you know what the brilliant early 20th century physicist Albert Einstein considered to be the key to creativity? We've all heard of Einstein. He said the key to creativity is wasted time. Isn't that interesting? Wasted time. So, if you're somebody that likes to waste time, you've got Albert Einstein on your side. That's not bad, is it? It's pretty good. I won't ask for a show of hands, okay? What's he saying? He's saying that if we pack our schedules so tight that we never have time to let our mind just drift away, to exercise our imagination. To daydream a little bit about what we might do in serving the kingdom of God or how things might get better in the church, well, we'll never really come up with any creative ideas because we'll never really reflect deeply enough on life and on circumstances. And I just want to ask this question, could that be one more reason that God built Sabbath? into our lives. This weekly rhythm of take a day to rest and there's no pressure on you and just enjoy the day. Worship me and enjoy the day. And let your minds drift a little bit. 
The disciples said, okay, Jesus, we'll give you what little we could come up with. Here it is, the five loaves and the two fish. And that leads to what I'm calling the creativity act of faith. It says Jesus took the five loaves and two fish and looked toward heaven and blessed them, started handing out the food for the, for the day. Folks, in serving God, we come to points that for something amazing to be accomplished, we have to step out in faith. We have to. In this case, it was Jesus who really supplied the faith. The disciples were playing along, but they really didn't see how this was going to work, did they? I love this story about Abraham uh, back in um, Genesis chapter 17, you know. He had been kind of working with God about this promise that, you know, Sarah was going to conceive and, and have a child, and he had already done the whole uh, attempt to fulfill the promise yourself with Hagar, and Ishmael had been born, and God said, no, that's not the way we're doing this. Sarah is going to conceive. You're going to be the father of a son that you're going to name Isaac. And it says that, this is what I love, it says, Abraham bowed down in worship. Then it says, but inside he laughed. Inside he laughed. Inside he doubted. Inside he was going, I got to see this. And it says right there, you know, Sarah was 90. And Abraham was 99, almost 100 years old. He was doubting God. So after everybody had eaten plenty, it says they took up 12 basketfuls of leftovers. How did that happen? Did these people just have super small appetites? Is that what this story is really about? They just took little microscopic portions. You know, there are people out there that kind of want to spin the story that way, but that's not the way it reads. Mark was there. That's not how he writes it up, okay? God just blessed this food, and it was continually being multiplied, so there was plenty for everybody. Kind of reminds me of this uh, old song, and, and I hate to do this because I always kind of give away my age when I say I remember this song a long time ago. But it was uh, by an artist named Danny Bell, and it was called Ordinary People, okay? And it's really, it's really great theology, kind of a cheesy song, but it's really great theology. She's got this line in there where she says, little becomes much when you put it in the master's hand. Little becomes much when you put it in the master's hand. Amazing what God can accomplish when we say, God, this is all I have to give you, but I'm giving it to you. What can you do with it? So here's the question. When have you stepped out in faith to do something creative, something a little different, something outside the box in serving God? When have you taken what you have to give, great or small, and put it into the master's hand and said, God, here it is, use it. Something that you were passionate about. Maybe something that you had a special talent for. Maybe it was a hobby. Amazing how we can serve and honor God with our hobbies. I told you earlier that I've asked a few people to join me this morning and uh, really finish this sermon by uh, sharing about ways that they have honored and served God in creative ways, okay? So we're going to do that right now. And I think I've got a microphone somewhere around here. I am going to ask Fabiana to come forward. I don't know if you know Fabiana or not. Fabiana Steele is our weekly child care coordinator at KCC, okay? And uh, so if you don't know Fabiana, you do want to get to know her, all right? Fabiana's fun, okay? So Fabiana, interpretive dance. And you use that to serve and glorify God. And in your church and other churches, you've had opportunities to do this as a part of the worship experience, right? All right, so tell us a little bit about how you honor and glorify God. Uh -oh. <laughs> okay. As a little girl, I always had a passion to dance and always danced. Then um, as I grew up, I wanted to serve God. And, you know, and my love for God grew with, within me. So dance and um, my love for God and to serve Him fused together, you know. And um, when I dance, it's basically it's my outpouring of my daily walk with God. It's not just a dance, 
but I think it's like important to have a relationship. So it just like comes out. This is for me. Um, for the church, I always think as how can I um, deliver truth and uh, inspire others to also come forward through their giftness to worship God and present what they have. That is awesome. And so without any further preliminaries, let's give you the opportunity to share with us through an interpretive dance. Sometimes I think, what will people say of me when I'm only just a memory, when I'm home where my soul belongs? Was I loved when no one else would show up? Was I Jesus to the least of us? Was my worship more than just a song? Awesome. Amazing. I would like to now invite Billy Torbenson to come forward. Billy and her husband, Bill, all right? 
uh, are uh, part of our congregation here at KCC. All right, now, uh, Billy is an artist, and uh, she has done this beautiful piece of art here, and she's got another piece of art in the foyer. So after the service, if you want to talk to her about it, she'd be glad to share it with you. Let's step over here where we can get close to your art, and you can explain a couple of things. You take that microphone. First of all, Billy, uh, it's beautiful, and it looks to me like it combines a couple of things. There's some painting, but then when I look, I see it looks like it's three-dimensional. How do you, how do, you do that? Yes, I, um, I uh, use one piece of paper, but then often I will cut it or carve it with a knife and pull it away, or in some cases, I will have different pieces that I add. And then uh, in case of the feathers, I'll use an X-Acto knife to put the little lines in, paint over that, and then wipe it away so it's been carved. And so um, people say, how long did that take you? And I said, how long do I love my husband? I can't, you can't count what, you know, God calls you to do something. You got to do it till it's done. And that's what, that's what I do. And God has blessed me with this. So this is the result of just this creative urge within you and yes. this artistic gift that God has given you. Mm -hmm. Tell us about this piece. What's happening here? Well, my uh, son-in-law had a, a terrible car accident heading west on I-90, and he was killed. And my grandchildren were uh, 7, 9, and 11. And so the day we went over there, there was a lap for each of us to hold one, my, da my daughter, Carrie. And so after this happened, of course, a lot of dark times, a lot of times of need, a time of praising God. In fact, Sonny, my son-in-law, wrote in his bulletin two weeks before God took him that he would do whatever God asked of him, my, him and my daughter. And so this is what happened. So this particular painting is showing the, um, the uh, providing the needs of, in this case, it was Elijah being fed by the ravens. And God has provided for my daughter and their family abundantly, more than they could ever have thought so. And the one out there is another expression of mine. And God, I don't ask for this. He just fills my mind with an idea, and then I have to work at it until it's finished. I don't know when it's done till it's done. And you can ask my husband how much time sometimes that takes. So you use art to express what God is laying on your heart, and he reassured you that he would provide for your family, for your daughter and your grandchildren in the midst of the tragedy they were yes. dealing with. And the story, uh, I believe it's 1 Kings 17, mm -hmm. tells about how God provided for his prophet Elijah and, and, and gave him food from a raven. And uh, I've told my grandchildren and anybody else that'll listen that um, I look for God's thumbprint every day. In fact, it's something I pray that I will see God at work around me. And in my business card, it says I celebrate God and his creation, which to other artists, I'm not worshiping Brother Raven or with Sister Wolf. And so when I try to speak of God, you know, they kind of, <coughs> but I don't care. And um, so this is my God has gave me a love for art and give me this skill. And when people say, oh, Billy, you're so talented. And, and I say, well, God gave me the gift to express my art, and it's my gift back to him to do it. This is a, a pretty unique form of art. I mean, it's mm -hmm. very, very beautiful, but it's not something that you see every day. And it involves several, uh, you know, dif different kinds of artistic yes. form. I, I thought I invented it until I had to teach it somewhere, and I did research, and um, the Chinese have been doing this oh, for wow. a thousand years. That's amazing. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? Well, so. that's great. Let's show our appreciation to Billy. Uh, and, uh, you know, I really encourage you to stop by uh, the foyer where she has another piece of her art on display and, and learn more about it. All right, now we have Jonathan McKenzie. Now, Jonathan, I'll give you the microphone, and you can Thank answer you. a couple quick questions for me, and then we'll turn right. you loose to talk about what you're doing. Uh, but uh, uh, what grade are you in? I'm currently in eighth grade. Okay, you're an eighth grader. Where do you go to school? Cedar Heights Middle School. Cedar Heights Middle School. A little shout out for Cedar Heights, okay? Oh, yeah. And uh, you love sports, is that right? Oh, I love sports. All right, good, good. And um, you are in what we call PDR, Project Deep Roots, at yes. KCC. Okay, now when I was your age, 
uh, the church I grew up in, they just had a real boring name for that. They called it confirmation, okay? Uh, but, you know, you've got to come up with better names for things nowadays, right, Pastor Ruby? Confirmation, way too boring, okay? All right, so we have Project Deep Roots, and I, I think it's a great description because we really are trying to help you all form deep roots in Christ as you go through those middle school years. All right, so you've figured out a way to bring sports and teaching some important truths from Scripture together. Would you talk about that? So um, I brought my love of sports, you know, soccer, basketball, football, and I brought it together with my love for God, and I kind of put it together to teach Him the fruits of the Spirit, so self-control and kindness, and I think it's like just the greatest lesson ever is the self-control one because I find my myself not having self-control sometimes and I think you know in a game where anything can happen is the best it's the best to have self-control during that and uh, you know and it's not just about the sports either it's also I saw a need kind of when I went up to the middle school and the middle school and high school worship and I saw that the fourth and fifth graders and they kind of become disconnected and isolated you know and I see that and I'm like how can I change that so what I've done is I've got them together for a couple hours you know eat some food together play some sports just have a blast and you know it's really bonded them together and I think that you can keep their friendship forever honestly Great. So you, you bring these fourth and fifth graders together and you do this like once a month or something on a Sunday afternoon in the KCC gym. Yep. Eat together, you, you teach them about uh, the fruit of the Spirit and how God's working in us to develop the fruit of the Spirit. And uh, sports is a good place for that because yeah. of the competitive nature of it. It, it really tests us <laughs> sometimes, doesn't it? Yeah, those referees, man, I swear. Oh, okay. So, so, so it's, it's about the referees, and, and they make some bad calls, don't they? Yeah, those donkeys. And some, yeah, okay. And sometimes <laughs> you just have to learn, you know, to let the, yeah. let the fruit of the Spirit uh, work in you at those times, okay? We know a little bit about that. What was it? Super Bowl 2005? Oh, something boy. like that. Yeah. So oh, I think boy. everybody can understand that thing about the referees don't always get it right. But isn't this a great creative way to bring together his love of sports, his love of God, and his desire to teach the scripture and have an influence on the kids who are a little bit younger than he is as they're coming up? Thank you so much, Jonathan. That's awesome. That's awesome. All right. Now we have Emily Brown and Marissa Carpenter. Would you guys come up? We'll let you two guys stand up here together, okay? Come on over. We'll start with you, Emily. I know I tried very hard to embarrass you at the last service, but it wasn't that easy. How many of you know Emily? Raise your hand if you know Emily. Okay, so Emily, you got a real cheering section over here and a few more people over here as well. How many of you would like to know Emily? Raise your hand if you'd like to have Emily as your friend. See all of that potential out there? Okay. Now, I've just gotten Thanks. to know Emily just a little bit. Um, Emily is kind of famous in our church, and she's new at KCC, graduated from Seattle Pacific, I think, two years ago. Uh, but she's famous in our church for who her roommate is. Who's your roommate? Yes, uh, uh, Ruby. Pastor Ruby is my roommate. All right, she's roommates with Pastor Ruby. Now, that's cool all by itself, oh, okay? definitely. All right, so uh, I learned about this from Pastor Ruby, by the way. Uh, Baking. You like to bake. You like to cook. So how do you use that to serve um, God? Yeah. So I really like to bake and cook. I'm not very good at it. Still learning. But um, I really enjoy it. Um, and it kind of came out of um, this last year I spent in Zambia, Southern Africa. And I was living with a host family. And uh, one of the things I learned and observed through that experience was um, hospitality and hospitality around food. Um, people would come to our house, um, not, they didn't have an appointment or we hadn't planned to visit. They just stopped by. Um, and we were always giving food. Um, and the same for when I'd go and visit places. It was the first thing that when I went to someone's house is they'd offer me tea and then probably a meal. Um, and I learned to leave my, my house hungry because <laughs> wherever I was going, I was going to um, kind of be lovingly forced um, some food. So it's been fun to kind of, um, I wanted to keep that aspect that I learned there and apply it into my life here. So um, it's been it's been fun to learn about cooking and 
Yeah, and you work for World Relief yes. Seattle, an office right down here in Kent on Central Avenue, and uh, you're often connecting with refugee families, right? In fact, you told me that sometimes you're the one who goes to the airport, mm -hmm. picks them up, and takes them to the first place that they're going to live, to their apartment, yeah. and that's a great time. But talk about how you've used that in reaching out to refugees. Yeah, um, well, a lot of the places where we're receiving refugees from, the same idea of hospitality is very present. And so um, when I was first starting, I started out as a volunteer. Um, I, would, I was really nervous about going into people's homes. Like, I don't speak, you know, Farsi or Arabic. What, am, what are we going to do? Um, and I found food to be a great cultural bridge. You don't have to speak a common language to share a meal. And um, it's been fun to use that now and gain more confidence. People tell me, like, I'd love to volunteer with refugees, but I don't what about the language barrier? And um, yeah, you don't, you don't need to speak another language to share a meal. Um, so there's a family that lives in Ruby Nice Complex, and we've been kind of playing a tag with a plate of food. Um, so on Wednesday, they showed up at my house with a big plate of Iraqi food, and um, I took the plate back with um, some peach cake on Friday, and we've just been playing tag back and forth with this. So. Isn't that great? So it's reciprocal. It's, you, you bless mm -hmm. them with food, they Definitely. bless you with food. That's awesome. And, um, you know, hospitality really is big in lots of cultures around the world, even bigger than it is here in the mm -hmm. U.S. So food, that uh, really speaks powerfully. Well, thank you, Emily. Let's show our appreciation to Emily for what she's doing there. And you can hand the microphone to Marissa. Uh, now, Marissa, tell us about some of your creative hobbies, one in particular, and how you've used that to serve God. Sure. So um, I like to crochet. And um, I also am really involved with student ministries. I'm a leader in the high school um, youth group. And a few weeks ago, we had our Show the Love auction, which is our big fundraiser where we raise money to put on different events. And we use that money for scholarships for kids to go on mission trips and things like that. So it's a big auction, and I really wanted to be able to contribute and help out, but I don't, I'm right out of college, so I don't have a lot of money, don't have a lot of things. So I had to get creative, um, and I was able to crochet a couple of scarves um, and donate those to raise some money. So. And they sold pretty well and raised some money. Surprisingly, yeah. yeah. So, um, Marissa, where did you learn to crochet? Um, initially from my grandmother. She taught me when I was younger, um, but then I kind of lost the skill, lost the hobby. But then when I got into college, I had some friends on my dorm, in my dorm, that were pretty big into crocheting, so I got back into it then. So in college, you spent a lot of time crocheting? Yeah. When your mother and I thought you were studying, <laughs> and we were paying big bucks for that college education, you were actually crocheting a lot of that time? All right. Well, the truth comes out. Uh, I'm glad that you were able to use that, and we'll continue to think about ways to use that for the glory of God. That's great. Let's show our appreciation to Marissa. Lots of things we do, oftentimes hobbies, can be devoted to the Lord and used to serve Him and to bring glory to Him. So use your imagination. What have you got? And how can you use that to glorify God? Let's um, join our hearts together in prayer. God, thank you for all the gifts you've given to your church and the gifts that you've given to your people. Lord, um, remind us that we really don't have anything that is intended to be used only in a personal, self-centered way, but that everything we have and everything we are, everything that makes us us, you have called us to dedicate and to devote to you. Uh, thank you for those who have opened up the window on their lives and ways that they're doing that. Thank you for many, many, many others in the congregation who have gifts and talents and abilities that they're devoting to you and to the work of your kingdom. Keep us inspired and stimulated and thinking about more ways to serve you and to glorify you all the time. In Jesus' name, amen.